it's an amazing <laughs> college, what they all do. The next speaker is Dixon Depollier. High buildings, to me, have nothing to do with food. They are for apartments or offices, and certainly not for producing food. But we don't want to be all pessimistic the whole day, but I have another pessimistic thing. Uh, the population grows, and in 2050, all, uh, most of the people live in urban uh, areas. Um, so how can we get all healthy food, good food, and in a food in a sustainable way? Dixon de Pombier, together with students, found a world revolution. Vertical farming. Dixon, please come here. My voice is strong. I could reach the back of the room. All right. <laughs> All right, I'll do this. So this is what we face. An in increasing rates of climate change and urbanization. And both of those things have a negative impact on the global food systems. That is, if there are such things as global food systems. The big challenges that everyone faces over the next, let's say, 100 years, if we can think in terms of that. Safe and abundant water supply. We saw how little there was and how little there is. It's not going to increase or decrease. It's going to stay the same. But it may be distributed differently. And that's a huge problem. Together with that, of course, we have to grow our food, and that takes water. We have to make sure that it's safe. We have to reduce our, independence, our, our dependence upon fossil fuels. We have to become independent of fossil fuel use. And we know this. And then finally, something that might be a little unfamiliar to you, we have to repair damaged ecosystems that we have commandeered for our own purposes. So food and water, those are the basics, of course. So let's just talk about them. How much land do we actually use to produce our food? Everything you see here in yellow, Landsat 8, thank you, was generated through NASA's ability to now look very closely at all the plants on Earth. And they can tell you which ones are edible. And if you add them all together, 7.25 billion people require the size of South America just to grow food in the ground. This doesn't count grazing animals. That uses a tremendous amount of water. We use 70% of that just to grow food. And you know as well as I, it's just isn't a matter of putting water on the ground and putting a seed in there and uh, throwing a little fertilizer and hoping for the best. There's a lot of technology involved in this. What that results in, however, is something that was not addressed directly, but obviously near and dear to the first speaker's heart, and that is agricultural runoff. It's unpreventable. It happens every time it rains too much. And as the result, all of that agrochemical uh, cocktail that was put on the land to make our food grow in a, an efficient and, and a harvestable way is suddenly being washed down into the ocean. And here's what happens in the Gulf Coast, and I'm sure you're painfully aware of this. Uh, my home is New Orleans, and that's at the bottom of an enormous river system. And look what happened to the Gulf Coast during these horrible floods that we've had. All that agricultural runoff has come from the Midwest, where the heartland of farming is. We can't afford to let this go on. So even though cities only occupy 2 to 3% of the land mass of Earth, some 3.6 billion of us live in cities right now. And in another, let's say, 50 years, as Nelika said, over 80% of us will live in cities. So we're city dwellers. We like being in cities. There's a lot of social services there that we make use of. But we get all of our resources from the countryside. Cities are responsible for 70% of the CO2 emissions present on the Earth right now. And that's having huge impacts on the planet. So city 
is what we should be directing our attention to. And here it is, presented as a resources in, use it, wastes out system. We know a lot about how much comes in, and we're certainly painfully aware of how much goes out. And very few of us have an idea of what happens to it in the meantime. But we have to start to keep track better because virtually every city on this planet is now considered unsustainable. I had a student once that asked me, what were we looking at here? And I said, you're looking at people's houses. She said, that can't be right. I said, did you ever see Slumdog Millionaire? She said, yes. I said, that's where they filmed it. So here's the big question. And the answer is, sure, we can do this. Three billion more people require a land mass the size of Brazil if we're going to continue to farm in the same way as we do now. So we can't do that, because Brazil certainly will not donate their land to somebody else. But we also have to do this. We have to do two things, not just one thing, two things. So I ask you, can we? And <laughs> there's only one answer. <laughs> That's the answer. But of course, it raises the question, how do we do this? We do it by creating a new way of living. Actually, it's not so new. We have to take our cues from nature. And that's the N in pink. There's no other place to look for the answer. Why? Because that's what gave rise to us to begin with. So nature has the answers. What's your question? And so the question is, how can I live my life as sustainably as the natural world just outside my window? How do we do that? That's a design question. OK. Here's the design comparison. Ecosystems are interconnected and functional. The built environment is disconnected and dysfunctional. Ecosystems rely on cycles of renewability. And, of course, we are linear in our thinking. We end up with piles of trash that we don't know what to do with. If you continue this analogy, ecosystems use plants to feed the rest of the members of that pyramid. If 50% of the world uses this, the half of the size of South America just to feed itself, you can see what's missing in this equation. So we need to fill that blank. So here's a possible solution. Why don't we find a new way of growing food that doesn't take up much land, that's right around the corner from where we live? And in fact, it's much more productive. We can see how much more productive simply by looking at a year-round growing cycle versus a seasonal growing cycle, for instance. And I know what you're thinking. Hydroponic food, it doesn't taste good. There's no terroir. You know, when you're, <laughs> when you're hungry, forget the word terroir. <laughs> Just think of the word food, and you'll be fine. But additionally, if you abandon farmland, guess what happens? And you turn your back on nature, it says, are they gone yet? And then, of course, they grow back to the way they used to be. And that's what we really need to do. We need to repair and create cycles of renewal within the city. And we use technology for this. If anyone here doubts the advantages of technology, then you can, I see some empty seats. Maybe those were the people that didn't come because they didn't like technology. But I know everybody here embraces it. That's how you got here. That is from your house to here. So I'm suggesting that perhaps we can grow food in a different way and efficiently in buildings. So here's what you could end up with if we were to do that. And we see these cycles of renewability based on the fact that we've produced food within the city. And we have to find a use for all the byproducts of our own metabolism. So if I were king of the world for one day, I would say no city can ever discard fresh water, no matter what form it's in. So if it's gray water, I want it drinking water again. And we can do that, so why don't we? We don't value it enough. Here's the proof that we can do this. Well, the proof that we can do this is the fact that we're already doing it. So here is urban agriculture. This is a child that was a, uh, a project in a school to just prove that we can grow food in the city. But we can see lots of examples today of urban farming. 
And here are a bunch of rooftops all throughout the city of New York and some other places too. Uh, food grows very nicely on the rooftops, as long as you feed it. Uh, but of course, in places like New York, Brooklyn Grange is at the bottom. Wintertime comes, and the next thing you know, it gets cold. Just down the block, of course, there's Gotham Greens. <clears throat> they started out as a 2,000 square foot facility and grew into a 20,000 square foot facility as soon as the new Whole Foods was put in in Guanas Canal. A brownfield, by the way, which was reclaimed. If you go to Montreal, note the snow on the ground around this picture and the happy look on this owner's face. It's actually one of, I told you so, I can do this. Not only could they do it, they did it twice. So this is a newer building that just opened in Montreal. Here's one in New York City on the top of an apartment complex. Imagine living in this apartment complex, growing some of the food you need every day on your roof and selling the rest to get a break on your rent. Pretty cool. I like it. It's only two years old. Florida? Sure, that's where we are. Let's go to Epcot Center. Let's go to Tim Blank, who used to work there. He got this brilliant idea. Maybe I can grow food outside of Epcot Center and actually share this with the rest of the world. And so he invented Tower Gardens. And if you go around the country, you can find these in lots of un unexpected places, like O'Hare Airport, that supplies all of the produce for all those high-end restaurants that are now popping up inside the airports because the airlines refuse to feed us. So you have to get a good meal before you take off. We know this, don't we? The New York Giants, the New York Giants were my old baseball team. I loved them. They moved to San Francisco. I was <laughs> quick to catch myself here. <laughs> I moved from California to New Jersey the year that Bobby Thompson hit that home run, and I became a Giants fan. So the Giants moved back to San Francisco, not moved back, but here they are making a food court with Tower Gardens. It's now a new industry, and it's generated through the ability to produce the right wavelengths of light for plants indoors. High tech, sure. Expensive, yes, originally, but not today. The efficiency of LED lighting has gone from 28% two years ago to 68% today. That was a huge jump in efficiency making it financially feasible for everybody to do this. And so here's where we can find ver vertical farms. If you go to Japan, you can visit hundreds of them. Why? Because they had a big event. <laughs> it wasn't one they expected. It was a very, very large earthquake, which transformed their country and made people aware of the fact that when you eat something, you better know what's in it first. Because instead of taking their food to the checkout counter, they took their food to the Geiger counter first, and then to the checkout counter. And if it registered something, they rejected it. Now there are hundreds of vertical farms in Japan. So we can reuse old buildings, as is done in Chicago. This is the plant. Here's another one that's commercial, 150,000 square feet of farm. She's won awards. She did this because she was afraid for the future of her children. A lot of us have that concern. Here's where her produce is sold. And just down the road from her, we have Green Spirit Farms in Michigan. Again, commercially successful. They're going to open two new farms in the next year. One of them in New York City. I'm very excited about that. You go down the road from there into uh, Indiana. And you know this is the agricultural heartland of America adopting vertical farming, because there is something called winter there. I know. No one here knows what that means, but winter <laughs> is that time of the year where it gets really, really, really cold. There are some other producers, too. In new buildings in Korea. I visited that one. There's one in Japan, but here's the building. This is the grocery store in Japan. You can go pick your own produce, take it home. It's 10-minute old food. Here's the building that I want to work in. It's called Pasona O2. It's in Tokyo. The people are shopping for their lunch inside the building. There's one in Singapore, a little different construction, but nonetheless nice. If you go to skiing in Jackson Hole, look for this in a local neighborhood near you. Plantagon, a 14-story building is planned for Sweden. So who's going to work in these farms? These kids. They're learning science, technology, engineering, and mathematics 
in their hydroponic greenhouse on the rooftop. They teach all sciences using plants and fish. So what will your city look like in the future? What will my city look like in the future? We have a choice. You can make it look like the one that's dirty and crowded with no sun, or you can make it look this way. I picked this one. I think we should farm smart and save the planet. If you want to know more about this, of course, read The New Yorker, <laughs> or read my book, or listen to my podcast. <laughs> OK, it's a cheap plug, but so what? I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> this is the lesson, though. This is our home. If we don't take care of it, we're lost. Thank you. Thank you.